Good morning, everyone. Good to have you here this morning. <laughs> during, these, um, during these next 10 minutes, now I guess about 8 minutes, this is a time uh, in our Sabbath morning experience where we talk a little bit about life in our Centerville Church, some of the things that are happening, and I've been asked to share a few thoughts with you this morning, and so uh, I wanted to share just a few thoughts with you from the Camp Re. Uh, we had the chance as a family, my wife and our three children had a chance to go out to Gillette and, uh, and experience that. I know that in Pastor Michael's sermon, he talked, he, he talked quite a bit about the, uh, the experience. Uh, let me ask you this. How many of you here have ever been to one of those big camperies? There's, okay, a few of you. I have to tell you, uh, this was the second one I went to. The first one that, uh, that I, sh I say we as a family went to was five years ago in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And I was completely blown out of the water. I mean, it was, you can watch the videos of it. You know, you can purchase them, you can watch them, or you can even watch them live when they're live streaming. But there's nothing like actually being there. You, I mean, you can't really appreciate the, the experience, the full experience, unless you're there. I mean, you're sitting there in a sea of 60,000 people. I mean, it was just absolutely incredible. And I want to say that it's such an uplifting experience, I think. And this is just wishful thinking, but boy, I, I wish... And I think that every single one of our young people, especially, should attend a campery. And it would be great even if adults, you know, a lot of the adults could come and experience it. There's something about being there just that is so, so moving. Um, it's just hard to, hard to explain unless you have been there. Well, I want to share just a few thoughts. I only have a few minutes here with you this morning. I'm going to share a, a couple of thoughts. And, you know, you think about it, where do you begin? I mean... Where do you begin talking about an event that takes five years to plan for, right? Five years of intensive planning. Every five years, uh, this event takes place. Uh, where do you begin? Well, I'll share a few things with you uh, that were meaningful to me. And by the way, I just want to say that uh, Emily Trejo, who is our Pathfinder leader and, and her team, they, they are fantastic. They do such a great job. They sacrifice so much time and energy and to to uh, commit to our children, and so if you see them, you see her, you see her team, please thank them, and let them know how much you appreciate uh, what they do. But in the, in the near future, she's going to be sharing a lot more about the campery, and they'll have pictures and slides, and so you'll get s some more of that. Um, let me begin, first of all, with the journey out to Gillette. You're driving out, and um, I had the privilege of going with the cook, Paulette, Jennifer, and Olivia, and I got to drive out in her RV. That was a first-time experience for me, driving an RV. That was interesting. I was a little bit nervous, I'll tell you, at first. But once I got in it and we got out on the highway, it wasn't so bad. But, you know, when you think of North Dakota, I mean, when you think of the Dakotas, North and South Dakota, what do you usually think of? You think of cold, harsh winters, right? And that's... I really didn't know much about the Dakotas. I've been out uh, to North Dakota once, and you just you kind of think about the brutal winters, right? I did not realize as we drove through South Dakota just how beautiful South Dakota is. You get into the Black Hills and that region. Some of you have been there. You're shaking your heads. Isn't it beautiful? I mean, I, I was just amazed. Everywhere I turned my head, I was like, wow, this is great. I was so inspired, I think I'd like to take my family out there on a vacation sometime again in the future. It was so, so nice. But here's my point in sharing that, spiritual point. To me, when I was driving through there, I saw the fingerprints of God everywhere. You know, God's fingerprints are everywhere in creation. God is, even though we live in a world that's so scarred by sin, there's still a lot of beauty in our world, isn't there? There's still a lot of things in, in our nature, the nature around us that, that shouts to us that God is alive and well and God loves us and cares for us and he's given us all these beautiful things for our enjoyment. So I was reminded of God's love for us by, just by the, the beauty of nature. Um, the other thing I, I really appreciated in this um, campery 
is the reminder that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is an international movement, a movement of destiny. I was reminded once again that God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist Church, not just as another church on a street corner, but as a movement of destiny to proclaim the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Did you realize that? That's, that's what God is mentioning. That's what he's describing. He's talking about us. We're, we're part of that great movement. And when I, when I was there in this great mass of 60,000 you know, people, and I, people from all different cultures and different, uh, different, I heard many different people speaking many different languages, and you know, there were, there were uh, different races and cultures, and it just young and old, and you know, it, was a, it was a tremendous experience, and I was reminded once again of the privilege that is, is ours to be part of a, of a great global church, and inspired by the fact that our church has made such inroads in so many different parts of, of our world, and how, you know, reminded the Seventh Adventist Church is one of the fastest growing churches in the world today. Now, sometimes we scratch our heads because we look around in North America and we wonder how North America and we wonder how can that be. But in many other countries, the Seventh Avenue Church is growing in leaps and bounds. And to see all these different people uh, at this campery was definitely a great inspiration to me. Another very exciting thing, and maybe the most important thing of all, two of our young people were baptized at the campery. And again, if you've ever been to one of those camperies or you've watched it while they're streaming it, they have the big, beautiful stage, and then on either side of the front of the stage, they have swimming pools. And these kids just stream in one after another, one after another, and they baptize hundreds of these young people. Um, the speaker on, on, I guess it was, would have been Thursday night, made a very strong appeal, and several young people went forward and... and uh, but it was wonderful to see these young people giving their lives to Jesus and being baptized. That was very exciting. And so grateful that two of our own, from our own church right here, made that decision. And let's see, two more thoughts that uh, I want to share with you. We, uh, we often think maybe of these kind of events as just maybe what it's doing for us there in the camp. But, you know, it affects the community around the camp as well. And of course, there were a lot of groups, uh, Pathfinders, that went out into the community and they did service projects and so forth. But you know, we had an experience that kind of reminded me of Jesus and the woman at the well. Remember, when Jesus reached out to her, he asked her for a favor, didn't he? And that's what opened up her heart and, and changed her life forever. Well, before we went out there, my wife went on to the Pathfinder website because we were trying to figure out how we were going to get our laundry done. And there was a woman on that website that was listed as someone that would do laundry. And so my wife contacted her before, the, before we went out to the campery and then uh, you know, made arrangements so that she could come and meet us there and we would give her our laundry. And so she came. We were, we were down located in the very southwest corner of the camp. And there was a fence. They had a fence all the way around it. And that girl drove up, and she was on the other side of the fence, and we lifted all the laundry over to her, or my wife did, and, um, and she took it home and she washed it. And then on the day that she came back with it, I went with my wife to pick it up and she was on the other side of the fence and we were there and she was lifting it over in bags to us. But she was a young woman and she has a little, a little child, a little girl, I believe it is. And she just was the kindest, nicest person. And it was, it was really a, ver a, a pleasure to meet her and to talk to her. And... Um, she was so grateful that we were there in her community uh, and so thankful that uh, this uh, event was taking place. And it was really, uh, I don't know how true this is, but it, I heard a couple times it was stated that this was the largest event ever to take place in the history of Wyoming, <laughs> in the state of Wyoming. So it was big. I mean, this was really big. And it, but she, uh, she really appreciated it. But, so we talked to her for a little while, and my wife and I both agreed, you know what, let's keep in touch with her. Let's keep in touch with her, because she's like, well, if you come back in five years, she says, you know, let's connect again. But we're going to try to stay connected to her, pray for her, uh, send some gifts for her little child, maybe some storybooks and things of this nature. So pray that God will bless in that, uh, in that effort. One last thing I'll share with you. I, I shared this with the kids um, 
I was asked to share a little devotional thought with the kids on the last morning that we were there. And um, I, I stood there in front of them and I, I asked them the question, I said, um, how many of you are looking forward to getting home to your, the comforts of your own home, to sleep in your own bed, to be able to use a, a nice, clean bathroom, you know, to have all, all the amenities and, and comfort. Every hand was up immediately, you know, like, wow, we can't wait. And I said to them, well, you know, as I've talked to you throughout this week, many of you shared with me th the really neat experiences that you had. And there were a lot of really great experiences, but, but there were a few little bumps in the road. You've, you, most of you have heard about the weather, the wind, and the rain, and, and, and having to cut the camp very short by one day. And so I said to them, you know, um, even though there were a lot of great experiences here, you had a few little disappointments. I mean, it was disappointing to wake up and, in the middle of a rainstorm and, and roll over into a puddle in your pool and have your sleeping bag all wet and to have to spend the next half of the day, you know, trying to arrange everything and clean up the... And, and then it was disappointing when the, wind, when the second time the windstorm came through and, and knocked down a few things and again there was wetness and all of that. It was a little, a little disappointing. And, and yeah, the porta potties and, 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 and all of that, and, uh, and it, it was disappointing that I'm sure that we had to cut the campery short by one day. But, you know, we're heading home and you're going to be in the comforts of home and I want you to think about this for just a second. That whole experience is really kind of like the whole tenor of our lives. In life, we have good experiences and we have disappointments, don't we? And they all shook their head, yeah, you know, we have good times and there are sometimes there are bumps in the road, sometimes there are disappointments. But just remember that on this journey of life, amidst all that, you're headed home. And someday, we're going to be headed home to the, to the kingdom that God has prepared for us. And all the comforts and the pleasure and all of the wonderful things of heaven will await you. And just like you're heading home to the comforts of your home here in, in a, a day or so, someday soon we're going to be arriving in the comforts of heaven. And so what I, what I shared with them, I share with you today in closing. Uh, life is a journey. And there are, great, there are good times and, and exciting times and happy times, but there are also disappointments in life and there are discouragements in life from time to time. But let's not forget that we're heading home. A better day is coming. And all the comforts and all the joy and all the pleasures that God has prepared for us await us. And all the trials and difficulties and the disappointments of this life will be gone forever. And when we're, when we're in God's kingdom, we'll have to really try hard to even remember what the disappointments were here in this world, right? So thank God for the Pathfinder Campery. Be praying. We got five years to get ready for the next one. And uh, it's going to be a great experience then as well. And so uh, if you've never experienced it or, or you know of some children, uh, maybe uh, your children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews or neighbor children, and you'd like to sponsor them to go to the Campery, I would encourage you to do it. It's a great, great, uplifting, reviving experience. And I thank God that this church has a passion for young people and a Pathfinder Club and leaders that are committed to the task. So God bless you. It's now time for our Sabbath school classes. And so I'm going to turn this microphone off and turn it over to our teachers. God bless you.
All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath School time. Good morning. And as our custom is, is there uh, to start with any praises? Anybody want to go ahead? I have a praise today because we've been praying for Todd and the tumor in his lungs. Yes. And he went to the James this week for a scan, and it came back very good. It's still there, but it's smaller. Uh, and so we're praising God. That's what we're asking God for, to shrink it to. All right, praise the Lord. Yes. Any other praises? Yes, Sandra. Uh, just thank you for all the prayers that the church did for our grandson. He had several episodes where he stopped breathing. Mm. Um, oh, my. Spent a night at Children's Hospital. Unfortunately, he was Sandra. not having seizures. <coughs> Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he was a lot better Thursday evening when I was there, so just I'm thankful that he seemed to be back to himself. Oh, praise the Lord. Yes. Excellent. Anyone else? Hearing a lot of feedback on the microphone. Thank you. Any other praises? How about prayer concerns? I know we always have a lot of concerns. Yes. <laughs> Brian. Allie, I understand, is working with a new prosthetic company. So let's pray that she can get her prosthesis that she needs so much so mm -hmm. she'll be able to move about and, and uh, do things again. Excellent. Any other requests? All right. <clears throat> Well, let's just bow our heads for prayer and ask the Lord to bless this time. <clears throat> well, Father in heaven, just thank you that we have the opportunity to come together um, to worship you and to study your word. And as we uh, open your word this morning, we just pray that your Holy Spirit can speak to us, um, that you will uh, lead us that you will uh, teach us things that will encourage us and uh, that by coming together we can encourage each other. <clears throat> this morning we just want to thank you for the way that you've worked this past week and I thank you that Todd got good news with his scans that uh, the tumor in his lung is shrinking and then just pray that that will continue. Um, thank you for blessing uh, Sandra and Harold's uh, grandson and just uh, pray that you'll continue to heal him and that will continue to restore him to good health. Um, we do pray that you'd be with Ali, who's been, just had such a, a struggle after uh, struggling over a year with the infections, and just pray now that as she's getting fitted for prostheses, that that would really change her life, and that you would uh, make that happen. We've had several uh, silent prayer requests. Uh, one of our members with uh, surgery this past week for a lung tumor, we just thank you for blessing, yes. and we just pray that you continue to give her healing. There are many others that are <clears throat> battling illnesses, um, and we just pray that in a very powerful way that your Holy Spirit would be there to bring healing, and that you would teach us how we can be a comfort and encouragement to those that are in need. And uh, now, again, we just dedicate this time to you. We pray that you bless each of our families, bless our church, bless our school. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, somebody who <laughs> does this regularly, what time are we supposed to stop? The second bell, I know that. <laughs> okay, you're gonna have to help me. All right, this is a uh, confession. I did not fully study this lesson. I was literally glancing over it, <clears throat> but um, we are today looking, uh, continuing our study of the book of Mark, and we'll be finishing up with the second part of Mark, um, chapter 8, and going through parts of chapter 9. And so, 
How many of you studied your lesson diligently? <laughs> when I went to a small 20-member church, they would ask that every single week. How many pieces of literature did you pass out? Who studied their lesson? And they actually wrote it down. <laughs> and uh, we've come a long ways to where we don't do that. So as uh, you guys have been studying, as we've been studying the whole book of Mark and going through this, we picked up on a couple themes. One of the themes is that uh, probably behind the author of the book of Mark is the influence of Peter. And Peter was a man of action, and so we, can, we are seeing the steady march. Um, Lindy said that we begin down and we're, 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 we're beginning this climb up to the cross. We're beginning this march, this steady drumbeat of moving toward what Jesus was here for, what his mission was here for. And we're going to see that a little bit again as we move forward. We're also going to um, encounter uh, parables, and we're going to encounter um, miracles. And so the lesson it asked us to start with uh, Mark chapter 8, and then we're going to go on into Mark chapter 9, the whole chapter. And in Mark chapter 8, um, verse 22, let's start with that, is the story of the healing of the blind man. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, Jesus had come to Bethesda, and they brought a blind man to him, and he begged him to touch him. Now, what's unique about this healing, this, this, this healing of this blind man? What's unique about this? <clears throat> Somebody who has studied, what's, what's different about this healing than every other healing recorded in the Gospels? It's a two-step two miracle. Yes. The only time that there was a two-step miracle. Lindo, you were going to make the same comment? I've always, I've always been rather perplexed by this one. Yes. When Christ does something, he typically does it completely. <laughs> When he speaks, it happens. Uh, so there's, there's something much deeper here than what meets the eye. So sometimes Jesus uses opportunities to make a point. And so maybe that's what's going on. Joe. I tell you what I got hung up on was his sighing. His? Jesus sighing when he did this. Oh. So I, what I does? saw the two-step, but I saw in the middle of that him sighing over having And what do you take from that? He's extremely frustrated when our eyes are open and we can't see. Yes. Okay. And so you remember the story. You looked up and he, the, the man said, Jesus, he said, I see men walking as trees. If you were completely blind and you came to Jesus and he healed you to where you could see the faint shadows of men, would you be happy? Yeah, this would be a huge improvement, right? <clears throat> so it's, but it is kind of bizarre that in every other, um, every other miracle, um, Jesus, the healing is usually uh, instant. It's usually complete. Like Lindell said, God, when he does things, he does it completely. And in this one, the guy is partially healed. It's as if he still has cataracts over his eyes. Yeah. Ron. Mm -hmm. And so being blind and seeing for the first time, it's not just opening your physical eyes so you see the signals coming through. The brain isn't processing it because it's never had it. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, there's, there's a lesson here, which I, I'll let you get into, but it's well, a two-step <laughs> two because the physical eyes were healed, yes. but it doesn't, doesn't mean he was understanding what he saw. Okay. <laughs> so... Yeah, I think Jesus is absolutely illustrating that there's two parts to healing. And uh, I think we talked about it before, but the word soza um, is used in the New Testament to heal someone physically, but it's also used for spiritual healing. And I think um, every one of Jesus' miracles um, had the purpose of relieving suffering, but didn't they have a bigger purpose? If we just... A lot of us are in healthcare, 
Um, we know, I know how to help you live an extra seven to 15 years longer by following the health message. But is that the purpose of the health message? Just so you can live an extra 10 years on this life without disease. And if as a physician, if that's the only thing I do is point my, my patients to help them have a healthier life for another seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years by stopping smoking, by changing their habits, what is that? Nothing in the great scheme of eternity. And so the word soza, putting together the physical and the, and, and the spiritual, I think this is really being played out purposefully in this miracle. And so then uh, he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up and he was restored and saw everyone clear, clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. <clears throat> and so for some reason, there was a second touch, the second touch to bring complete healing. Dr. Small, you know, and that, I love this class. Everybody's help, so helpful. <laughs> Anybody. Yes. Um, as we present the gospel, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us to know how to present it. The two stage healing. Mm -hmm. came, okay. If you dump on somebody everything you know all at once, <laughs> you're going to you're going to make them sick to their stomach. Yes. Um, Jesus wants us. Will give us the grace of how to present this. You know, we we'll often say for a person who's not acquainted with us, to start out with the mark of the beast is probably not the, the best way to help them learn to love our God. Um, and Jesus was, we're supposed to witness to what God has done for us, but we, we need to use compassion and gentleness and diplomacy in how we present it. So... <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're absolutely. So in, in, in medical ethics, we call that truth dumping. Often if we, if you, I'm sure in your practice, when you saw a patient for the very first time and there was a nodule somewhere, you didn't just immediately say, oh, you have cancer. You'd break it to them slowly. Like, well, there's a concerning nodule. It might be, we don't know what it is. You had a pretty good idea what it was, but you wanted to get them used to the idea so that they could handle the truth. And if you just dump the fact that you have cancer immediately the first time you see them, you might completely overwhelm them. And you're saying the same thing's true with the gospel. <clears throat> it reminds me of a story of a, of a, I'll come to you in just a second, but a story that a pastor, old retired pastor, he's now 100 years old, but he told me a story that stuck in my mind that um, this old itinerant, an itinerant pastor had a 20 different church circuit where he'd ride his horse to go to the little churches out in the, out in the west. And uh, so one day it was a very, very snowy morning and he came to this church and an old farmer showed up, just one person in the church. And the pastor said to the farmer, they'd, they'd warmed up the church and he said, he said, well, should I give my sermon? And, the, doc, and the, old, the old farmer said, well, I suppose that if I went out to feed my cows and only one cow showed up, I'd feed her. <laughs> so the pastor gave his sermon. He went through everything. And at the very end, he said, well, how'd we do? And the farmer said, well, I suppose if I went out and there was only one cow, I wouldn't dump the whole load. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, we have to be kind of careful. So, Robert. Yeah, Brian, uh, last night I was watching a PABN, and they were saying that uh, the spitting of the, on the eyes was a treatment that was prompted in that area. And what Jesus was trying to show them that you can only get partial healing from man. I will give you complete healing. So we went to the second part to show that God is the one who will heal. Okay, I like that. So thank you. So you get partial healing from what? Modern medicine can do. Only God can bring true healing. Yes. I think the scriptures inspired by the Holy Spirit who give us eyesight, right, is not an accident. The very next verse is verse 27. Jesus is asking his disciples who are really going to be the beginning anchor of the church, who do men say that I am? Yes. And nobody knew Jesus' mission, even though he told them over and over and over again. 
we need eyesight to mm -hmm. see who Jesus is. Yeah, so I think that's crucial that, and, and let's go ahead and move on to that session. We're gonna jump over it real quick. Those of you who are in first service, we've talked about this out of Matthew in our sermon, <clears throat> but uh, you're in for a treat, those of you who haven't heard the, the sermon yet. But so let's move on to verses 27, 28, 29. Um, 30, so Jesus said to his disciples, uh, Jesus and his disciples went out of the towns of Caesarea Philippi and on the road he asked his, his, his disciples, who do men say that I am? And the answers floating around were, he's a prophet, maybe John the Baptist, one of the prophets come back to life, certainly a good man. And uh, that, so obviously there's a lot of confusion as to who Jesus is. And a lot of confusion about uh, a lot of confusion about what his ministry is, and so he makes it a lot more personal. He turns to his disciples and he says, "Who do you think that I am?" And of course, what did Peter say? So, what does Jesus say over in Matthew? What does Jesus say to Peter? How did he? How did, Jesus, how did Peter come to this conclusion? The Holy Spirit revealed it to him. So this isn't something that's obvious, right? Jesus is going around, he's ministering to people, he's preaching the gospel, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and it's not obvious what his mission is about. Um, probably because of the culture, probably because things were so distorted, but this group of people, the Jews, should have been the first people in the world to know that now is the time this is the time that the Messiah is going to come. He should be coming to be our Savior, and none of them knew it. Go ahead. So isn't there confusion about Jesus today? Amen. And I think that he's asking each one of us, you know, who do you think I am? Mm -hmm. And so the only way we can know who Jesus is is through his word. But the rest of the world, they're, they make up their own idea about who Jesus is. Amen. So no, that's an absolutely good point. So we live in a culture um, that it can accept Jesus as a good man. They can accept Jesus as doing good things, revealing things about God, but it's really hard in our world today to accept that he is the Christ the savior of the world, the one true God, the only truth in the life, and that there is no other way. And when you start talking like that in our culture, um, you've just shut the door. And what you mentioned, to make it personal, we, Jesus is asking every one of us, who am I to you? Who is Jesus? Go ahead. Even though he reveals who he is, they still don't understand anything about what he's talking about. They think the Savior is going to get rid of the Romans mm -hmm. and bring a new political system in. And, and they don't know anything about what he's, he's going to do and his mission to go to the cross, which is a totally different thing from anything that they've ever heard of. It's an anathema to them, right? What is it to us? to recognize that Jesus says, take up my cross and follow me. There's something about the cross, the self-denial, <clears throat> self-sacrifice, there's su su suffering, something about the cross that we despise naturally, right? <clears throat> and his disciples were no different. And yet that's the very purpose that Jesus came. So that's going to keep moving us. I'm trying to, I don't, I actually don't know what time we end. So I don't know if we're moving too fast or too slow, but let's move on to um, verses 31 through 33. So Jesus uh, began to teach them. He teaches them that he must suffer. He's going to be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, and he's going to be killed. And three days later, he will rise again. This should be pretty sobering, right? This should wake them up. This should jar their thoughts that, huh, this isn't about the Romans. This is about something bigger. John. So we're just talking about acknowledging who he is. Cancel culture says, if you say who he is, we're going to reject you. Yep. You're going to suffer. And we might even kill you. 
So is that any different today? Exactly. Not really, is it? <clears throat> so we still live in the same sort of environment. Wendell, you got? You know, I've read this story so many times, and it's, it's always said, you know, if, if the disciples had had a clue, their lives would have been so much different. But Christ treated them with grace and mercy. And the fact is, we, we lose sight of it because we have so much more, and God has to treat us with so much grace and mercy because we don't get it either. Even as Christians, there's so much that we miss. We need God's grace. Amen. All right, so it doesn't say what all the re disciples' response was, but it says that Peter, and remember Peter's kind of behind this, writing this, so this is <clears throat> Peter's influence, but Peter began to rebuke him privately. What do you suppose Peter was saying? Lord, you, you can't die. This isn't what you're here for. Um, Think about that if we do that in our lives today. God has a plan, God has a purpose, and it's so foreign to us, we just basically reject it. We can't deal with it. Peter couldn't deal with it, the thought. And so over and over, Jesus tries to tell them what his mission is about, and they completely missed it. And it reminds me, even on the road to Emmaus, even on the road to Emmaus, after the crucifixion, after Jesus is resurrected, they're still not getting it. This is a completely foreign idea. Go ahead. I don't think it's that they're not getting it. It's just that they had preconceived ideas. So they're rejecting as it. As to what they think his mission should be. Yep. And it was personal for them, the Jews, because they wanted freedom from the Romans, and that was foremost in their minds. So they couldn't get that thought out of their mind. And they refused, I think, to accept any other role or function for Christ because they had an agenda and it was pretty personal. So we often get very caught up in our preconceived ideas and it prevents us from hearing other people's ideas. And in this case, it prevents us from hearing the truth. Go ahead. In, in the, the preconceived idea was Jeremiah says that, that you know, God knows he has, has the plans for us, knows the plans that he has for us. I, I paraphrase that for myself. I know the plans you know, I have for I, you. I, I, right? Yes. I, I have bigger plans for you than, than you have for yourself. And, you know, and, and Peter was seeing a small piece of, of, of what Christ was about. He, he, he got it, but he didn't get it. He saw part the of the plan, plan. Exactly. He's but, right. He's missed, all, but not missed the big picture. The big picture. And if we go back to the parable that started off this section, not the parable, the healing miracle, are we any different than the blind man who could only see part of the healing process? That's kind of what we're seeing here with the disciples. So maybe Jesus used that two-step healing process to show the disciples what they were missing in this whole process. And he's just using things over and over to try to bring it back home. And so Peter, who just literally I don't know how long ago, but 20 minutes earlier, or three verses, five verses earlier, was God, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but the Holy Spirit revealed it to you. All of a sudden, five verses later, is suddenly, I rebuke you, Satan. That also should be, I mean, we could, we, could, we could come off a moment where we are inspired by the Holy Spirit and five minutes later we could have the spirit of Satan. That's a really, really scary thought. Very scary. Uh, Joe. It seems appropriate that that statement that Ellen White gives us, if we could see the end from the beginning, we would choose to be led in no other path than the one on which the Lord has led mm -hmm. us. And unfortunately, in our cosmic scheme of things, when we see the small picture and we don't by faith trust him, mm -hmm. it typically gets us into trouble, right? Mm -hmm. And it's that trust that is developed through this experiential, which this lesson is really pressing hard on us, I think. It's about having an experiential relationship versus just a knowledge, which we Adventists tend to be pretty good at. Mm -hmm. So. So we have a knowledge. You could almost say that we know the end from the beginning, right? 
Do we have an overview picture of the end from the beginning? Yes, we do. And yet we're caught up in our little day-to-day -day issues where we miss the whole big picture. Michelle, microphone's coming. Um, I think what sticks out to me is when Peter, he gets uncomfortable that Christ is going to um, be rejected and die. That is about, we don't like to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And if Christ is, if all of that's going to happen to him and I'm his disciple, ooh, that puts me in a bad spot too. And I don't want to be uncomfortable. Um, and I think about the lie in the Garden of Eden, you shall not surely die. Yeah. And a lot of it is when we follow Christ, there is going to be suffering. And so many times when we are going through those trials and those hard times, we're like, eh, I don't like this. And, I, and we want to get out of that as soon as possible. And that's what Christ, I think, was trying to teach Peter um, was that when you follow me, it is not going to be comfortable. And in this life right now, um, society is constantly teaching us about being comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much our whole world is what can you do for you? Mm -hmm. It's all very inward focused. What feels good. What feels good. Mm -hmm. And it is very experiential in that I want to feel good. You can have your own truth. Right. You can and live so your own life. And so that's why it's mm -hmm. so important to have the knowledge yeah. and the experience, but one without the other, you're going to fall off either side. Yes, absolutely. Right behind you, Lindell. I was thinking about um, what you were saying about Peter at the moment when he was rebuking Jesus. And I was thinking of the blind man. So Peter at that point was the blind man. Yes. And once Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, because Satan was blinding him just mm -hmm. like the blind man. Mm -hmm. And once he said that, he lifted up his eyes and opened up his eyes again as the blind man had once seen. So just like us today, sometimes we can get blinded by Satan. Yes. And we need Jesus to say to rebuke Satan so we can start seeing again the, the Holy Spirit, him, his holy words. And uh, I can see that correlation between both Peter and us. Mm -hmm. As sometimes today we can't get blinded at once in a while, but we have to come before Jesus or come before God and pray to rebuke Satan to get behind us. Yeah, absolutely. In my own life, when I struggle with things, it ultimately comes down that I have to just pray, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Yes. And we are always, it seems like, being confronted. Some of, that, some of it is good things and some of it is purely selfish things, but we are constantly being called back to make, put our eyes back on Jesus. And to do that, we have to say, not my will, but yours. And so that's going to keep moving us. So we're still only in chapter 8, the last few verses, and we've got to go through all of chapter 9. <laughs> Although there's one part of chapter 9 I'd just as soon skip over. But uh, we'll try to go as quick as we can. All right, Ron, before we move on to verse 34. You know, these stories are good and interesting, but unless we can apply them to our lives today, it's, it's not as meaningful. And there's mm -hmm. just a two-sentence that Ellen White says says, the events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. Mm -hmm. Just like Jesus told his disciples over and over and over what was going to happen, that he was going to suffer, he was going to die, he would be raised in three days, they could not and did not understand or believe it. We have been told over and over and over, and I believe probation is about to close very, very soon. Mm -hmm. We don't believe it. So you say we don't believe it based on the way that we continue to live our lives as if they're just gonna continue, right? So, so we have every evidence through the spirit of prophecy 
through the end time prophecies that show that after 1844 is the time of the end, um, that we are a last day people with a prophetic message that needs to be given to the world, the three angels' messages. And yet, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are here now five generations since 1844. And so this wasn't designed to be a church that goes on, perpetuates to our children, and goes on and on and on. This was supposed to be a movement, a prophetic movement that swelled into this warning message that would prepare the world for Jesus to soon come. And it's because of our unbelief as Seventh-day Adventists that that has not yet happened. And yet, I believe every generation, the Holy Spirit is poured back out that God is calling them to be that final generation, that God is going to have a people, and I personally believe it can't go on beyond the fifth generation. I believe so many bad things happen after five generations. If you look at the Amorites and the Amalekites and various prophecies, but uh, God is calling us. The world around us is falling apart um, politically, economically, environmentally, so many, many, many things. There's going to be a hand right up here. And uh, that clearly all of heaven is prepared for this to be the end, and yet we're going on like it's just business as usual. So it is a wake-up call for us, this lady right here. Go ahead. Well, looking at Revelation 3 of the Neodicean church. Yes. And he's talking about the eye salve. So anoint your eyes with the eye salve that you may see. So it's the same salve that he put on this blind man. Yes. You know, he wants our eyes to be open. And there's a song, you know, open my eyes that I might see. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's our journey in prayer is to ask the Lord that our eyes would be open. So if we, yeah, if we apply this, God has had the same struggle throughout history that he has with us now, and it's to get us to see. We're comfortable seeing men like trees, and he wants to give us crystal clear clarity. And, the, and he wasn't surprised by the fact that we're five generations of Laodicea. He gave us the remedy. He predicted that it would happen, and it is to anoint our eyes with eye salve so that we could see. So way in the back. Not, not to go too big picture here, but going back to approach, right? If mm -hmm. we contrast how Jesus healed the blind man and the fact mm -hmm. that he was focused on meeting his physical need so that he would then be open to Jesus meeting his spiritual need in yes. that relationship, he didn't come at him with some hard cutting truth before opening his eyes. Mm -hmm. But with Peter, somebody on the inside who should have known better, yes. he was quick to say, get behind me, Satan. So I think sometimes we want to apply a one size fits all approach to mm -hmm. evangelism and witnessing, but we do need to be very, very paced and patient to go back to the conversation and the medical analogy earlier yeah. about how we are approaching people that don't have that experience with truth. But I do think sometimes within the church, um, thinking about it from- People that from, should know better. Yeah, Peter's perspective, Jesus was very quick to say that. And how often do we, Peter had good intentions, right? Mm -hmm. And his intention was to prevent somebody he cared about from suffering. Yes. Do we sometimes with good intentions try to prevent for the sake of harmony or whatever it may be, somebody who God has a mission or a plan for from doing something hard that we perceive may be uncomfortable. Yeah. It's just something to think about. Yeah, excellent. Um, no, it brings to my mind, I'm not a parent, so you guys can <clears throat> stone me later, but I see so many parents wanting to protect their children from the consequences. <laughs> and so sometimes we learn most from suffering. Exactly. Sometimes we learn to get prepared for what's to come because we've tasted the hardship of going to Gillette and having our tents blown down and sleeping in a puddle on the ground with wet sleeping bags. So um, I'm sure we all wished we could have put our kids in a camper, but they will remember that far better than the camping trip where they stayed dry. And so we need to remember that too. All right, we are going to move on. Verse 34, we're still in chapter 8, and then we're going to jump to, to uh, chapter 9. So now Jesus starts talking about the cost 
of discipleship. What is this going to cost? If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, what is it going to cost you? Everything. What do you mean everything? It will cost you your life. So Jesus doesn't just say that he's going to die and rise again, but now he starts saying, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, when we wear crosses around our necks, crosses around our churches, crosses are everywhere. They don't mean what they meant in that day. In that day, the cross symbolized the biggest stigma of the worst possible way to die, that it wasn't even legal for a Roman to be put on a cross. This was for runaway slaves, for traitors, for the really, really bad people. And it was, I mean, just imagine, you're lifted up before the world naked in all your shame, taking two to three days to die a most miserable death, the most shameful most shameful thing you could do, and Jesus is telling his disciples to do the same thing. How many people would want to be a disciple if that's what it's going to cost you? And I think it's in Matthew that, it, and I don't think it says here, but it says that many disciples started to leave at this point. When Jesus started saying, you got to drink my blood and eat my flesh, you got to take up your cross, and follow me, and I'm going to die, many disciples left. Why do you just suppose that these 11 of the 12 stuck with him? Maybe they didn't fully understand what it meant. Certainly after they were converted, they did. So I don't know how many of you saw little parts of ASI, but a couple weeks ago, Lindy and I were down in Florida at ASI, and Friday evening, uh, David Trim gave a presentation that was basically going through the early Adventist pioneers about how they established the mission work around the world. And all he did was tell story after story after story about this one, left everything behind, went to the mission field, and after 16 months, they died. <laughs> you heard it. <laughs> Another one. Left everything, their children died. Left everything, they died. One of them that just brought tears to my eyes and it might just telling the story uh, was a young, young man in his 20s left to go start the work down in Africa. He left Scotland, left a farm, and left everything. And within a few months, he died. And you think, what is the purpose for that? The telegram came back to his family. His brother was out uh, with a team plowing. A friend of his brought the telegram, and he read it, and he said, my brother has died. And then he said, I must go take his place. Oh. And for the next 39 years, he continued the work in Africa. The work, oh my goodness. <laughs> we haven't covered chapter 9. The work, the early pioneer work of Seventh-day Adventists was hard work, and it costs many people their lives. But what does it mean if you've given up your life in this world to gain eternal life? Um, absolutely nothing. All right, we have five minutes. <laughs> um, it's okay. We have not, kept, we have not uh, gone through chapter nine, but I do think we've covered a really important part of it. Um, the uh, next passage deals with the transfiguration. So do you think it was encouraging to Jesus or discouraging to Jesus to have his disciples saying, oh, no, 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 you can't go to the cross? They're really working against his whole mission. And do you think that would have had an impact on him? Think about in the garden where he's clinging to the ground saying, Father, if there's any other way, Jesus took our humanity, he didn't, it, it, our whole flesh riles at the idea of self-sacrifice. This was a real struggle. He sweated drops of blood. It was such a vigorous struggle. We have not yet persevered to that point. 
And yet, so now he's got his closest associates telling him, no, 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 that's not the path. You've misunderstood your whole purpose. And so I think God used the transfiguration to send Elijah and Moses, one that died for three days and was, was taken to heaven and the other one that never saw death to come down and encourage him. Jesus was a human looking at the plan that God gave him, being pulled by some humans to not do it, and yet God gave him every evidence he needed to be sure to his mission. All right, John. As a normal person, Jesus could have taken the attitude that I've, I'm a complete failure here. I've tried to teach these guys, and none of them understand what I'm trying to talk about. That would be a huge thing for someone who's a leader of a group. To, normally, you would just think, you know, well, my campaign is over. I'm out of here. But Jesus had the, the power of the Lord in his heart and the power of angels to support him. But he literally was alone in those moments before he died. Uh, because they just, they didn't understand. Yeah, so he was despised, rejected, forsaken by his own. And so we have no idea what he went through. So we don't have time to go into the other sections. I'd encourage you to read that um, this afternoon if you haven't. Um, just, yeah, just the thought um, that this was a real struggle for Jesus. His humanity was clinging to life. And yet he knew this is the purpose that I have come for. And to think about what, John, you just said, to think about that Jesus is willing to make this sacrifice on the cross, recognizing that the whole world had rejected him, even his closest disciples, it looked like this was going to be a complete 100% miserable failure. And I can think that he was encouraged by the sacrifice of Mary who anointed his body beforehand to the burial. Jesus had been revealing the idea that he was going to die and be resurrected on the third day to his disciples, and they completely missed it. But a woman who was at the lowest levels of society, who had been rejected by her family, that Jesus had cast out seven demons, she saw it. And maybe if she was the only one, Jesus would still say it was worth it. There was one more. There was a thief on the cross who said, Lord, save me. And this was a real temptation. Jesus could have said, this isn't worth it. There's only one or two. I'm coming off the cross. He could have. He was tempted three times to, to give up on the plan. He could have saved himself, but he couldn't save himself and us, and he chose to die so that we could live. Amen. All right, you get the last word. In my mind, it's disturbing that the people that Christ came to save were the ones that were trying to discourage him yes. from doing the act of saving them. Also, at that critical period when Jesus was about to suffer, this was the time when they had an argument as to who is the greatest. And it shows where their focus was. They wanted Christ to be in an earthly kingdom so that they could have high positions. Yep. And even in church, sometimes we can be misguided as to the purpose as why we're in this remnant church. At this critical period, what kinds of behaviors are we engaging in? Are our behaviors conducive? the preparation of souls for Christ's coming? I'll leave us with that question. All right. Well, you guys have been a wonderful class. I had no fear standing up here because I knew many of you would, would help. Um, you know, I wouldn't be uh, up here mumbling all by myself. So praise the Lord for all of you. Let's just close this time um, with prayer. So Father in heaven, let's thank you for the blessing of your Holy Spirit. Um, we covered so little of the lesson, but uh, what we covered um, is very encouraging. And Father, so often we are like the first blind man, the one that has experienced a little bit of healing, but we don't have the faith to believe that it can be a complete healing. We uh, see a little bit, but we're still complacent. And uh, what we really realize is that you have called us to an amazing calling to pick up our cross, to follow you where you went. 
um, recognizing that as it's like seed in the ground, that as we give our lives poured out to those around us, it will spring up a great harvest. And we just pray that we can be a part of that in any capacity. Would you prepare us, prepare a people to meet you very, very soon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Have a blessed Sabbath.